I can't believe you clicked on yet another chainsaw sharpening video. How many of these are you gonna? I bought a saw chain grinder. I know, I know, I felt the same way. In fact, if you were to travel to the future right now and tell future me that past me actually bought a chain grinder, present me would be rolling in his grave. Shh, listen, did you hear that? Bear with me just a moment. I wanna bolt this grinder down to my bench. I've had this thing a little over two months now maybe, and it's been hanging on the back wall way back in the corner where no neighbor can see it when they walk in. Makes it a little hard to get on video. I had zero plans to make a video about this thing. And just so you know, this is not gonna be about chain sharpening. It probably won't even be about how to use one of these grinders. Not directly anyway. Heck, I'm still figuring it out. But I have some thoughts. There are some things I'd like to try. And I know a lot of people own grinders like these, so what the heck. Those original holes were a little too far to the right anyway. They do say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. No one ever seems to mention how it chips away at your sanity. I should mention this isn't a sponsored video. I bought this with my own blood money. And these ain't cheap either. I mean, they're no Tormek T8, but still, ain't cheap. Matter of fact, I had to try to fix my milling machine with ball bearings they took out of some kid's skateboard because budget's got a budget. But I've always been chain grinder curious. How could one not be? Especially if you've got a bit of a hobby machinist slant to you to begin with. In some ways, this was inevitable. In the way a Tormek might be. Hey, hey, just talking out loud here. We're amongst friends, are we not? So of course I had to have the 620. This is the one with the hydraulic chain vise. Every time you pull the handle, the vise cinches up. The other models, it's my understanding, are exactly the same otherwise, except you have to lock manually for each tooth. There's like a handle you've got to turn for each tooth. Who's got time for that? Turns out, I do. I'm not yet convinced the hydraulic lock is worth the extra 70 or 80 clams, but I'm still learning, and we'll get to this whole thing in a minute. I'm a file guy. I've always been a file guy, but I'm not a file snob. And no offense to the chainsaw file snobs watching, I absolutely love you, but I enjoy grinding. I have a surface grinder, probably one of my favorite machines in here. And I've done quite a bit of very amateur, barely passable cylindrical grinding in my lathe. Whether it's here in the garage or out at the club, I enjoy grinding. But I get it, there is a simple elegance, an inner peace even, that warmly washes over a person when they consistently get a sharp chain off a hand file. And not to mention, this grinder is meant to fit a very specific niche in my garage. It's not meant to replace my files. Fact of the matter is, I do most of my sharpening out in the sticks. But I get it, I'll be honest, I've shared the same apprehensions you hear everywhere about these machines. They're not rigid enough, they eat up your chain, they cook the teeth, leave a burr, chain can never be as sharp as a hand file, etc. ad infinitum. But I'm here today to tell you after two months of owning one of these, and half-assed sharpening as many chains, I don't think it has to be like that. Heck, I'm just gonna come right out and say it. With some care, this can make a chain as sharp, if not sharper, than a hand file. Okay, fine, maybe not sharper. I'd have to think about exactly what that means, but definitely as sharp. If nothing else, certainly more consistent. This next part is gonna hurt me more than it's gonna hurt you, but I think it's a necessary evil if we're gonna understand what the grinder is doing. This whole thing is a chainsaw. It's smaller and battery powered, but it's easier to film. This thing wrapped on the bar is a saw chain. 
chain saw, saw chain, or just chain if you're in a hurry. If you're out at the bar though and you run into some lumberjacks, you can call this part the blade. They love it when you call it that. In fact, you should take the opportunity to say it a lot. Here's bigger chain. Might not actually be bigger, it might just be longer. But it's new. Literally just pulled it off the pegboard and took it out of the box. Zooming in on that chain was just kind of gross to look at. So I grabbed the new one. This thing is exactly like a bicycle chain, except it has cutters. These things right here. Not 100% sure what they do, but it's important to know that your chain has cutters. There are both right hand and southpaw cutters, and they alternate. Right, left, right, left. These are what you sharpen with your file or your grinder. There's one more thing I should add as it relates to the grinder. There are different kinds of cutters. Your chain might not look exactly like this. I mean, close, but different. There are full chisel cutters and semi chisel cutters. Variety is the spice of life. Full chisel cutters have a sharp outside shoulder and come to sort of a point when they're sharp anyway. Semi chisel have a rounded corner. This chain, geez, I think that's a semi chisel. You guys can probably tell better than I can zoomed in like that, but man, this thing is small. Yeah, I'm gonna go with semi chisel. Just to give you a sense of scale for size reference, here it is next to a single human hair. Big picture, different chains have different geometry. If they didn't, they'd be the same chain. Some might spend most of their time cutting pine, but maybe you're clearing mangrove in Florida or palm trees in California. Just like you might think a drill bit is a drill bit, you might buy them or sharpen them for different materials. For brass, maybe you'd put a drill point angle of 90 degrees on there, maybe 118 for steel, or even 135 for stainless. Or you might do what I do and use the same drill or chain for everything. Perhaps a knife might be a better example. You wouldn't sharpen a meat cleaver or an ax maybe the same way you might sharpen a paring knife. If you did, your ax might not last past one swing, right? Same goes for these things, but it's not really as dramatic, I suppose. The single stroke we're doing to file is basically two simultaneous angles. The one you see from the top and the one you see from the front. Those would be their technical names. The trick is you're filing both of those sort of at the same time. Form and consistency are very important. Don't be so focused on the top angle and lose track of the side angle or versa visa. The angles you happen to see here can change depending on your chain. In my case, maybe even generally speaking, it's usually 30 degrees on the top and perpendicular to your bar on the side, zero degrees or 90, I guess, depending how you want to look at it. Most chain these days, I think, now have this reference mark on the top. You see that little line sort of etched into the top plate? That's the recommended sharpening angle for this chain. Keep your file parallel to that mark, or as close as you can anyway, and you should be golden. I know I said this wasn't about sharpening chain, but just a quick tip. For anyone out there struggling hand filing a chain, maybe you're new at this and you went out and you bought a brand new file with plenty of bite to it, try snugging your chain up a bit on the bar. Tighten it more than you would if you were using it normally. A looser chain like this, especially with a new file, can sort of roll a bit as you're trying to push through that C shape and it can sort of bite. Your file might grab, you'll look goofy, and your friends will laugh at you. Try snugging it up, snugger than this, just so it's more solid. Do all of your sharpening, just remember to set it back to the correct chain tension. Now I don't like to do this very often, but I'm gonna be honest with you. For regular folk, unless you're doing something very special while you're filing, whatever angle you do, or however inconsistent you are, if you file off some metal from each tooth, your chain will probably cut better than it did before you filed it. Try to get each tooth to come back to a sharp or sharper edge than when you started filing. Just keep an eye out for new sharp metal. If for some reason they end up duller than when you started, you did something very special. But just like when you're drilling, milling, or turning, while you're cutting your tool, your saw in this case, you want it to be spitting out nice looking full chips. You want nice full curls coming off your saw. On the other hand, if you're just making a lot of noise, using up a lot of gas and making a lot of dust, it's time to sharpen your chain. Or maybe just get a new one. Unless you drag a whole tree back in your garage, most sharpening, percentually speaking, 
happens outside. So it's good to learn to sharpen with just your file. Though, I guess someone smarter than me could just bring a couple of saw chains with them. After a lot of sharpening, and you can file these teeth back surprisingly far before you need a new chain. Oh shoot, that reminds me. Let's head back to the second important thing to remember is to always keep an eye on your rakers or your depth gauges. Or as they're known on YouTube, the secret the pros don't want you to know. Even though it's on like page two of every manual. Each tooth, each cutter has its own depth gauge. Don't make me go switching out lenses now. I'll just throw up an image. That's the cutter we've been talking about, and that's its depth gauge. It limits how much the tooth can bite. If you were to completely remove the raker, your saw would be so aggressive, it'd tear your arms off and fly off into the sunset the minute it touches the wood. Notice the cutter is sort of slanted back, like a chisel. It's got some top rake. As you file that tooth away, little by little, sharpening it, you also make it shorter like top to bottom shorter, but the raker is not changing. So you're giving your cutter less and less wood to bite into. Think of rakers as the sole of a plane or think of them as rakers. What do I? The sole limits how much the plane iron can really bite into the wood. If you really stick it out, increase the distance between the sole and the cutting edge of that iron. Well, you'd need a pair of pretty strong horses to pull this plane across your work. If you keep sharpening that plane iron so far back that it no longer sticks out past the bottom of the sole, well, it wouldn't cut a thing. Again, the difference between where that plane iron is and where the sole is controls how much you're cutting. Ditto for the saw chain. Typically, you want a difference in height between the cutting edge of the tooth and the top of the raker to be about 25 thousandths of an inch. A smidge more than half a millimeter for you folks out there cutting down metric trees. Checking and setting your raker height is relatively easy. You check your raker height with something like this, or some variant of this. It's a gauge set to 20... Oh, have you look at that. 25 thou apparently is 065 millimeters. 65 hundredths of a millimeter. You just set it on your chain, and any part of the raker that pops up past that, you just give it a lick with a file. That'll set the offset between that tooth and that raker to 25 thou. You do that for each cutter all the way around the chain, of course. Now, what was I, as I hand file my chains further and further back, as I sharpen the thing throughout its lifetime, I start to pick up inconsistencies. Maybe not all the teeth are the same angle. Some of them might be a little shorter. And we won't even talk about the left hand cutters. Once I'm filing left handed, all bets are off. Cutters on my right hand side are textbook 30 degrees. On the left hand side, some of them are 25, some of them are 32. It's the wild, wild west over here. When that starts to happen, you can do one of three things. First, maybe practice more and get better at hand filing. Second, you could use a filing guide of some sort. Or third, you can cop out and buy a chain grinder. When I'm maybe halfway through a chain, come some rainy Saturday or Sunday, I'll sit down with one of these and maybe tidy the chain up a bit. These are maybe two of the more popular saw chain filing guides. Though I'm seeing a lot of those things with the little carbide burr that you spin. Seem pretty cool, a little expensive. Then you're locked into buying the burr. I don't know. This is your pretty basic file guide. It's just a plate that screws onto your file. It's larger has much clearer markings for different chain angles, also limits the depth of the file. It sort of sets the depth of your file in the chain. Keeps you from dropping too far down and not getting that hook on your tooth, I think. This one, on the other hand, is more like an orthopedic brace. This would clamp right onto your bar. Chain comes through that slot there. You set it all up and it literally holds your file in one fixed angle. This won't let you file funny. These can be a little tedious to set up, more often than not, I'm just using one of these. But once you do get it on there and get in the groove, they're pretty good, kinda like them. But speaking of pain in the butt to set up, let's get to the grinder. Big picture, I've been pleasantly surprised with this thing, right out of the box. Frankly, I thought I was buying into a project. I was ready for that going in. Specifically, I thought I'd have to rebuild the hinge. You often hear complaints about chain grinders not being very rigid. These all have hard stops, I think. You can adjust this screw to set your depth of cut, but if the machine is too loose or it's made out of plastic maybe, any differences in pull force on the handle means it would flex and the wheel could cut deeper in your chain. All that stuff we just got done talking about, cutter shape and sharpening angles, in hindsight maybe wasn't super important, but it did two things. First, and most importantly, content. 
Second, if you're new to this, hopefully that pep talk gives you better or some understanding of the adjustments available on these grinders. By loosening this knob on the bottom, I can articulate the vise. I'll set this to 30 for now just to keep my story straight. I can also move this vise forward and back. This mimics sort of tipping your file, that side angle. With the side angle set to zero right under the wheel, that tangent point, that grind point would be horizontal. If I push the vise back because the wheel is round, it's effectively like tipping your file back. This will grind more sort of up the backside. Ditto if you flip it the other direction. Which way you swivel this and or slide it fore or aft depends on which side of the chain you're sharpening. So you'd set it up for one side, copy those same exact angles for the other side, and work through your chain. Lastly, just like any tool and cutter grinder, the entire head rotates to the side. The head rotation doesn't really have a parallel to my file analogy, but basically it ducks the wheel under the cutting edge of the chain. Round files are round and can get into that gullet. Grinding wheel, not so much. So you have to tip that head in order to get under there. To figure out the head angle and the vice settings, you'd, in theory, I guess, look them up in the manual or check the box your chain came in. But I can hardly remember what I had for breakfast, let alone what chain I'm running. So I just sort of eyeball it. Again, the specific angles aren't necessarily important, unless you're grinding a chain for somebody else maybe. But the key here is consistency. You might be a degree or off according to the manufacturer, but at least all of the cutters will be the same. Sharp and the same. Granted, this just might be new guy talking here. But I think even if you know your chain and you manage to look up your angles, I'd suggest keeping a really close eye on that first grind when you're setting this up for the entire chain. When you make three or four angle combinations, like you're tipping the head, rotating the vise, pulling it forward, you're getting into compound angle territory. You ever set up a saw to cut the compound angles on some crown molding? Well, neither have I. But I'm willing to bet those aren't easy angles. It's not like 50, 30, 10. It's gonna be something silly, like a couple of degrees shy of 40, a couple of degrees over 50. I think the same thing's happening here. Though I have no idea why they wouldn't just list that in the manual. Like you think they would have that figured out. Which leads me to believe it's just me. But if I follow the book and set the head to like 55, the chain to 30, and pull it back 10, whatever it might be, I don't get as much of a hook to my teeth as I'd like. And it tends to grind into the side plates more than I'd prefer. I mean, grinding into that side plate is inevitable, I think, but the grind I get isn't exactly what I'd like. With the fiddling around that I've been doing, I found that something like 58 degrees instead of 55, 28 or 29 instead of 30, and seven degrees instead of 10, in the case that you have a full chisel cutter and you're trying to get that point back. But those weird numbers could very easily be some weird chain that I have or me just not knowing what I'm doing. Actually, let's see if I can show you the difference. This is the cutter with the quote unquote standard settings by the book as it were. And here's the one I tweaked a bit. A couple of degrees over or under the recommendation. My personal preference and what I shoot for when I'm using the hand file is just that little bit more of a hook. That tends to cut better for me. Probably won't stay as sharp as long as the one with less of an undercut. But moral of the story, you do you. I'm also finding that I like the thinner wheel more than the right sized wheel. It comes with a little dressing stick and a radius gauge so you can hang out and have some coffee and play Michelangelo shaping your wheels. The right profile is in there, you just have to liberate it. In fact, I might try to make a profile cutter, like a forming cutter, with some high speed steel. Somebody write that down. Something I'd like to try to fix right now though is the eccentricity of this wheel. It's not on center. I can see it, I've never actually measured it, but I don't know how else to show this to you on video. That's about 15 thou out. There are high spots and I can feel them and hear them while I'm grinding. High spots on a grinding wheel usually result in inconsistent grinds. Now granted, this isn't a surface grinder, but still there'll be high spots there that get dull first, load up first, and can cause things to overheat. Again, maybe not the end of the world for a chain grinder, and those dull spots would come out when you redress the wheel. They do recommend you dress this thing pretty often. But since it's a handheld dresser, you'll never get that out of round out. So I 3D printed a little jig. This will use a diamond nib from the surface grinder, if this works. I was gonna machine this. 
I even dug some aluminum out of the scrap pile and then I remembered I have a 3D printer. This is pretty old filament. These supports don't really want to come off. Give me a minute. I'll put this together. This is just a little swing arm that holds the nib. I'm going to clean this up, get some hardware on it. We'll mount it and give it a try. I had plans to hard mount this jig because I didn't know how else to attach it, but you can do a whole bunch of crazy junk with 3D printing that you probably would never want to machine. I don't have the right size screws. Don't judge me. Much better. No idea if it'll make a difference, but much better than before. For that one person out there watching, thinking, dang, I'm going to make one of those. A couple of things I would change. The hinge should be beefier, larger diameter. As it is, it's got a little bit too much flex in it for dressing a wheel. Second, I shouldn't have mounted this diamond nose first into the grinding wheel. Amateur move on my part, I apologize. I'll have to make a new one. But mount the nib at 10 or 15 degrees off. It still would swing that same plane that you needed to swing. But the way I did it, I may have just cut a flat on the tip of that diamond and completely ruined it. That wasn't a lot of dressing, but still, always mount these at an angle. Live, learn, forget, learn again. That's my way. My little hatchet for what this thing is, credit where credit is due, is a handy little thing. A year on and I still like it. Though Milwaukee says an M18 top handle saw is coming. If that's got a decent chain speed, more than this branch tickler here, I'm interested. We'll see. Anyway, this thing, great EDC chainsaw for the office, but it's not that fast and it's not that strong. Consequently, a sharp chain is imperative. Though full disclosure, I don't have the time of my life sharpening this thing. I don't know if it's got harder teeth or just that it's small and awkward. Not fun to sharpen. In fact, I take this chain off the saw and put it in my vise when it's time to freshen it up. So naturally, I figured the grinder would be just the ticket, except the darn chain doesn't fit. It's the knob that protrudes too far. I mean, if you really insist, you can sort of get it on there. Don't ask me how I know. But if you manage to do that, you can't really advance it anymore. So what I did is print a new knob. Almost the same thing, just shorter. And if you wanted to do this, you don't even necessarily need to print this. You know, just make a knob of any kind or just tighten a nut on there. It just needs a little recess for the spring. And given the way they cost to reduce these things these days, I'm surprised the spring is even in there. You remember earlier, like 40 minutes ago, when I said I wasn't sure about the hydraulic device on this thing? Well, when you're first setting up the chain, once you got all your angles set and you bring that wheel down, you've got to get that tooth in the right position. And there's a little backstop here, a little paw that you can adjust and sort of set where that grinding wheel meets the tooth, forward or back. And then do the rest, you just advance the chain to the next tooth, etc. and so on. To adjust that, you need to bring the wheel down to see how that wheel is matching up with the cutter. But when you bring this wheel down, you lock the vise. So you can't really make any adjustments with the wheel down in this position where you're comparing the two. So it's this constant check, lift the wheel, adjust, bring it back down to check. It locks, you can't move anything, so lift the wheel again, adjust. It's a little tedious compared to say the manual lock where you just leave it unlocked and then you can do all the adjustments you want. When you're happy, clamp the chain down. Now I know what you're thinking. First world problems? Probably, but I could have saved 50 bucks and bought a better grinding wheel instead. Can you feel how much smoother that is? I'm pecking away at the cutters to keep the heat down. I don't want to just drop this right in in one fell swoop. In fact, a little air blast nozzle wouldn't be a bad idea either. Maybe some flood cooling. So for the B side here, I made a mistake. I should have done this in two passes. These are the offside cutters for me. Combined with the short bar and the tight access, they've been filed less and are consequently longer by a lot too, I'm kind of shocked. And so it would have been smart to do these in two passes. Take off half, then take off the rest. Speaking of burning the teeth, 
that's a bit of a misnomer. If you grind too hard or too hot, you won't remove the temper because they're not tempered. Well, not as hard as that word temper might suggest anyway. If they were, you wouldn't be able to hand file them. And therein rubs the lie. If you go to town on these cutters, you risk hardening them. The problem with that is you won't be able to hand sharpen them in the field. I take it back. That hydraulic vise is kind of cool, I guess. Come on now, don't do this to me while I'm on camera. There's one more modification I would have liked to try and share with you today, but I haven't figured it out yet. From what I'm seeing so far, poor form or setup aside, it seems the biggest source of error, variation might be a better word, a better Scrabble score if nothing else, the biggest source of error I think is coming from this vise. I don't know if it's just my impression seeing everything move so much, but this whole setup doesn't seem exceedingly repeatable. I guess it wouldn't be hard to try to measure the repeatability of where it puts each one of those cutters. But my plan is to spring load this paw. I don't know if you can make it out. There's a little hole back here in the sheet metal part. And I was thinking something as simple as a little torsion spring in that hole onto this screw. Or maybe if I can get down here to drill a small pinhole for like a dowel, and just hook a small extension spring on there. If that couldn't help to just keep that saw down against these vice jaws and you know, maybe improve repeatability. This is adjustable, by the way, left to right. So you can maybe move it out of the way, still stop the cutter, but not grind your paw into oblivion. So whatever I end up doing back here, I want to preserve this lateral motion. All told, would I buy this grinder again? If you're asking me right now, yes. It is a lot of fun, though, I reserve the right to change my mind in a week once new toy syndrome wears off. If you sharpen a lot of chains, you do a lot of sawing, maybe you have a bunch of bum friends, or you're running a side hustle, then yes, definitely. If you like playing with tooth geometry, maybe you want to turn all your crosscut chains into ripping chains, then also yes, a grinder like this will save you a ton of time. Will you go through chains faster? That is a tougher one, and I'm speculating here, but I think the answer is a two-parter. In theory, if you're careful, dial everything in right, no, you shouldn't go through chains any faster. On the flip side, practically speaking, you and I most likely will. I mean, who are we kidding? It's a freaking powered bench grinder versus a dull hand file. Careful as you think you might want to be, a grinding wheel has the potential to remove a lot more metal faster. So it probably will. My money is on yes. Heck, I'd wager for every two chains you get through with a hand file, you'd go through three with a grinder. Yeah, that sounds like a lot. Maybe it's three to four. And perhaps the million dollar questions, are the chains just as sharp compared to hand filing? I'd say yes. Again, if you're careful and learn the machine, I see no reason why it shouldn't be. After all, the new chains you're buying fresh are all off a chain grinder, right? Now it does appear the grinder leaves more of a burr. I don't personally think that's a big deal or any deal at all for that matter. Then again, I'm not a competitive sawer. I think it'll be gone the second you sink it into some wood. But for people that have a problem with burrs, maybe keep that in mind. Though, since you brought it up, I don't think these grinding blades are doing you any favors. They're okay. I got three with mine, a 3 16 a 1 8 that I've been using almost exclusively, and then this flat one for dropping your rakers. These aren't the finest grinding wheels money can buy. Let's put it that way. If I end up using this thing a lot, my first investment will probably be better grinding wheels. Maybe a slightly finer grit, and something that grinds a little cooler. For home game sharpeners, we don't really need to remove this much material that fast. And again, if you're cutting into a lot of roots, maybe you do. What do I know? Anyway, that's probably enough talking for today. I've already said too much. Not to mention it's getting late and I need to run out and buy a few more chains. I don't know how, but somehow I've managed to grind through all of the ones I had here. As always, I appreciate your company and thanks for watching.